There are certain foods which have a bit of a negative reputation. They're associated with blood sugar spikes and crashes, diabetes and obesity. And so some people suggest that you shouldn't eat them and that they should be avoided at all costs. Others suggest that they're fine to eat in moderation and that they could actually benefit your running performance. Now I'm talking about high glycemic index foods and in this video, I'm gonna walk you through this confusing topics, the potential pros and cons, so that by the end of it, you have a clear understanding of what they are and whether you should eat them. And if you're new here, then hey, my name's James and I'm a registered sport and exercise nutritionist. I work with amateur and professional endurance athletes to help them train and race better, improve their recovery, and do all of this in a healthy fashion. Now, if you don't really know what the term glycemic index means, or what low or high glycemic index foods are, then don't worry because you're not alone. It can be super confusing. Now for reference, I'm going to call these GI foods in this video, not to be mixed with GI to mean gastrointestinal in some of my other videos. In a nutshell, it's the term used to describe how much a food can affect your blood glucose level, more commonly known as your blood sugar level. Now as a quick explanation on this, your blood glucose is something that is tightly controlled by your body and it wants to keep it in a narrow range and this is usually between 4 to 7 millimoles per litre. When it goes outside this range, your body will detect this and start a cascade of processes which will either raise or lower that blood glucose level. Now glucose is a simple sugar or simple carbohydrate and it's the most abundant carbohydrate in your body and is the main carbohydrate that your body uses for energy, both in normal daily life and during exercise. This might give you a clue that the foods that affect your blood glucose the most are carbohydrate based foods and fat and protein rich foods won't affect it as much. The glycemic index is a way of ranking how much a food could affect your blood glucose with a score between 0 and 100, with 100 being pure glucose, which serves as a reference point. White bread also usually scores 100, although this does depend on the exact type and how it's made. This is where some other foods sit on that glycemic index scale. For a food to be a high glycemic index food, it needs to have glucose in an easily accessible form and that's why pure glucose and white bread are ranked at 100. Your body needs to spend very little effort digesting and absorbing it, meaning that food can affect your blood glucose very quickly and in a more dramatic fashion. Conversely, when someone consumes a low GI food, it takes longer for the food to be digested and the glucose to be absorbed, leading to a slower and much more modest rise in blood glucose. And there are two major concerns with these high GI foods. The first concern is that it causes a sudden spike in your blood glucose level, meaning you have to release a lot of insulin to bring it back down again. By doing so, the worry is that you're working your pancreas much harder and more frequently if you eat high GI foods often, which could lead to developing diabetes and also contribute to obesity. The second concern is that these high GI foods often lack nutrients like fiber, protein, healthy fats, as well as vitamins and minerals, which overall isn't great because you're not supplying your body with the healthy things that it needs from your diet. Now, we need to talk about these two things properly. Firstly, unless you're a diabetic, the GI index of a food is really quite inconsequential in itself. It doesn't dictate whether a food is good or bad. It's a normal physiological process for your body to release insulin in response to lots of carbohydrates, and this is perfectly healthy and keeps you safe. Brands like Super Sapiens, who are now shutting down, and other influences have made people worry about a normal physiological response. And I can't stress enough that for the most part, you should absolutely ignore this. And the truth is that there's really no good evidence to show that high GI foods cause obesity, type two diabetes, or any other issue other than perhaps dental issues if you don't rinse your mouth thoroughly or have poor dental hygiene. Yes, they can contribute to obesity, and that's because high GI foods are generally unsatisfying from a fullness point of view and lack other nutrients, which could fit into overeating and a calorie surplus, 
but they're not the direct cause. And this whole insulin thing becomes less relevant as well because during exercise, your body has another pathway called non-insulin mediated glucose uptake. And we're gonna explore this more in a bit. But let's go back to the second concern about high GI foods and that they don't have a great nutrient profile. On the most part, this is absolutely true. The reason they don't is because they are chiefly carbohydrates with little fiber and are often processed. But that doesn't make them bad or unhealthy. It just means that they won't necessarily contribute to the nutrients profile part of your diet. If you are solely eating high GI foods, then sure, this could be a problem. But as a dedicated nutrition nerd, this isn't you, is it? If the majority of your diet is full of fresh, healthy nutrients, unprocessed foods then this really isn't a problem and this is why overall context is way more important by the way i have a free nutrition crash course that you can sign up to which covers the basic fundamentals to help you train and race better and i've put a link in the descriptions and comment section of this video so go and check it out and learn how easy it can be to improve your nutrition so now you know a bit more about the glycemic index of food and a bit more context to understand that actually it's not as simple as saying high GI foods are bad because it's more about the overall profile of your diet and it's time to talk about how they might actually be helpful. There are three areas that they can be fantastic for and they are before, during and after running. I had a client who used to get unpleasant tummy symptoms when running. I dug into their diet and noticed they frequently had a wholemeal bagel with full fat cream cheese before running. Now, there's not anything specifically wrong with this, but I suspected it might be the cause for their issues. Tummy troubles are a common problem for runners. Bloating, abdominal cramps and even diarrhea can happen and poor nutrition choices are often the culprit. The main reason is that the individual usually has undigested food in their gut still, which means it'll bounce around and contribute to all of those unpleasant symptoms. Now, one way to get around this is to use high GI foods before running because they're easier to digest and absorb and there's a lower likelihood they'll still be present in your gut, causing problems when running. So this would mean choosing white varieties of bread over wholemeal, and sticking to simple toppings like jam or honey. Reducing the amount of fiber, fat, and protein can be super helpful in stopping tummy troubles when running. In my client's case, I suggested swapping to a white bagel with low fat cream cheese, and this simple change fixed those nasty symptoms. If we look at the glycemic index scale again and go back to glucose, it's ranked at 100 and serves as a reference point. Now, if you're against high GI foods, then clearly consuming something which is pure glucose would be bad or unhealthy, but this just isn't the case during exercise. In fact, during exercise is the time where consuming pure glucose is amazing because your body doesn't need to break it down and it doesn't have to process extra ingredients like fat, fiber, or protein. So consuming high GI foods during running is brilliant because it gives your body the energy it needs while dramatically reducing the risk of developing unpleasant tummy symptoms. Sports nutrition products like gels, chews or bars, carbohydrate based drinks are all great examples of this and can be the perfect nutrition to use directly before or during running sessions and are actually way more beneficial than those lower GI foods, which are actually more likely to provide insufficient energy and also give you bad tummy symptoms. Now, earlier I mentioned non-insulin mediated glucose uptake, and this is a super important counterpoint to the whole your pancreas is releasing lots of insulin and it's bad for you debate. During exercise, your body becomes way more receptive to insulin and there's also a pathway available that means your cells can directly absorb glucose from your blood to then be used for energy. This means that even if you're consuming significant quantities of simple carbohydrates, so let's say 100 grams of sugar per hour, 
you will produce very little insulin and that carbohydrate will go to your muscles for energy or help provide extra reserves for your liver glycogen stores. Now, most of you won't need or tolerate that amount while running, and my usual recommendation is between 30 to 80 grams of carbs per hour, depending on whether it's a short run, a long run, or a race, but it's just to highlight a very important point and show how nuanced this subject is. But use this to your advantage and make sure you fuel your next long run properly. Another amazing area that you could use high GI foods for and improve your training and your recovery and your performance is directly after exercise. During your hard or particularly long sessions, you'll have used a significant amount of your body's carbohydrate stores and high GI foods can help replenish those glycogen reserves at a quicker rate. This is because those foods provide a quicker influx of glucose, which means it can be converted into glycogen to replace your glycogen reserves. The current guidance is that one to 1.2 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight after a particularly depleting session is the optimum amount, which means utilizing things like recovery shakes, smoothies, or sweets. So for example, a 70 kilo runner should consume between 70 to 84 grams of carbs if they had a particularly intense session, which depleted their glycogen reserves. Now this is particularly important if you have another training session later on that day, or for example, you're doing a session in the evening and have another hard session first thing in the morning. Now, I think it's important to highlight that I'm not specifically recommending that you smash a load of simple carbs after every training session, because that's not necessary. After easy, short sessions, so for example, low intensity training lasting less than 90 minutes, simply having a normal balanced meal with carbohydrates within 45 minutes of finishing your session is all you need. But as I mentioned, if your training volume is particularly high or you need to recover particularly quickly, then this could be a great strategy for you to use. So hopefully now you can see that while on the face of it, high GI foods might seem bad or unhealthy, there's really way more nuance to it than that. Foods are not inherently good or bad, it's just the context in which you use them. And using high GI foods in or around exercise can be a fantastic strategy. Now I have made a video on how to create your own sports drink, which you might find useful. And you can watch that video here to see how cheap and easy it can be.